All right, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're all doing well and welcome to my beginner's guide for Age of Empires 4. So in today's video, we're going to be jumping into custom games and showing you guys all of the basics here for the new Age of Empires title. So we'll explain how all the resources work, the victory conditions, how to advance to different ages, and we'll also very briefly touch upon, you know, very simplistic tactics and things like that. If you guys are veterans of Age of Empires 2 and 3 and you have a lot of experience in the game and essentially the genre of RTS, it might not be quite as useful for you. This video is more catered towards uh, folks who essentially are brand new to the Age of Empires game. Now, going forward on the channel, of course, I'll have more advanced guides that are faction-specific guides, multiplayer tactics, all that kind of neat stuff that you need to advance on to the more uh, high-level gameplay. But for this video, it is going to be a beginner's guide. So without further ado, let us begin. So one of the first things you'll see when you log on to Glorious Age of Empires 4 is you'll see the single-player and multiplayer menus. Now, they do have this very useful section called Learn, and they also have an in-game tutorial, which I would recommend completing. It has a pretty useful UI and kind of explains things and has, you know, interactive tooltips that pop up and show you the basics. But for the sake of this video, what I would recommend doing before you even jump into that is go to Learn and take a look at all the different factions here. So, for example, uh, there are some factions that are much easier than others. Relic has put something into essentially, say, the difficulty level of the factions, English, of course, being probably one of the more direct, straightforward factions. So for the sake of today's tutorial video, we will be using the English. However, pick a faction that calls to you. And again, don't limit yourself based on, you know, it telling you it's super hard because yeah, there are factions like, let's say the Delhi Sultanate, which are very difficult, but they, they all have a lot of things in common. And there's just a couple little nuances that make them different. Well, I would say a fair amount of nuances. They play very differently, but um, you know, don't let that dissuade you from trying out those factions. But first thing you should do is go to the learn section Let's say the English, for example, you click on them and just kind of briefly read over. So for example, England gets farms for 50% less wood, which is really nice, right? So in the game, when you're trying to set up your, uh, your food economy as you progress, England is gonna be able to set up a more sustainable food economy faster than the other factions probably can because they have to spend a lot more wood to set up farms. They're gonna have to rely more on wild game, whereas the English can set up their farms a little bit quicker. But this is the main thing. The civilization bonuses is what you want to read. So you just can kind of read about the faction. Okay, they get a certain type of troop earlier. Uh, earlier, You might not know what this means now, but I this is one of the first things I did. I went through before I played a faction. I read about all the civilization bonuses, and it really helped me as I was getting in. I was like, oh yeah, they do this, they do this. And it kind of gives you a basic idea of how to play the faction. You can read about the unique units and also look at them here on the tooltip. Nonetheless, just jump in here, pick a faction you want to try, read about them a little bit, and then we'll see you in the game in just a second. So after you've read up on your faction, you can jump into your own custom game. And something that's very cool about Age of Empires is you can create custom games and just play by yourself, even if there's no opponent. So this is a really good opportunity to just kind of explore the game as a beginner without being pressured by another player or by the AI. Essentially, just learn the tooltips, learn the hockeys, and learn to understand the basics of your faction. So what we're going to do here is pick the English, go on Dry Arabia, and just put it on small. It doesn't really matter too much. And we're going to fire this bad boy up. All right, now we've loaded into our first Age of Empires game. You'll notice at the top, there's a little bit of a timer. We're not gonna be paying too much attention to that today, but you can activate that by hitting F11 on your keyboard to turn it on and off. So as you load in and practice in these solo games by yourself, just against yourself, essentially, you can hit F11 and kind of track your time. So you can have a really scientific metric, be like, okay, how fast am I getting this amount of resources? How fast am I getting to the first age? So just kind of take note of that as a relatively useful tool. So before we begin, we're just not really going to be paying attention to time too much. Obviously, if you were to jump into a normal game, you'd be doing everything rapid fire. But in this case, I'm going to be explaining all the basics before we begin. So up in the top left here, you can see these are the victory conditions. You can build a wonder. Now, a wonder is built at the final age. It's essentially this big, massive building that costs a ton of resources. And you can win the game by building a wonder and controlling it for 15 minutes. This will, of course, give your opponent some time to counterplay and come in and try and destroy it. Also, it's a pretty big investment, so you either have to be very far ahead or you have to have a really good defensive infrastructure set up. Another way to win the game is with Sacred Sites. Sacred Sites are across the map, and we'll be showing you uh, them in a minute. They're essentially capture points, which if you control all three, they essentially give you uh, a 10-minute timer in which your opponent has to either take one of them from you or uh, they lose the game. And also, Sacred Sites do give you a periodic income of gold. The third way to win, which it does not articulate up here, is to destroy all your opponent's landmarks. What this means is you destroy their town hall and any unique landmark buildings which they might build here. So you can see we have the landmarks that you build to advance to the next age. So you would need to destroy all of these. So those are the three victory conditions. Just kind of keep those in mind as you go forward in your game. And plan ahead. If you want to go for a sacred victory, go for more map control, right? There's, there's a bunch of different ways to play it. 
So down here on the bottom left, you can see there are four resources in this game. We do have food, we have wood, gold, and stone. Food is used to generally produce uh, infantry, soldiers, villagers, all that type of good stuff. If you look here, you can see the villager costs 50 food and uh, the scout costs 60 food. So you're gonna need food pretty much over the course of the whole game. And something else that food is also used for aside from producing things is advancing to the next age. So in order to get to the next age in this game, you need 400 food and 200 gold. And that increases as you go to the later ages, essentially. So it'll become, I believe, uh, 1200 and then 600 and then 2400 and 1200 respectively. So food is a very important resource, one of the primary ones. There are other ones you can kind of do without at points in the game, but you really need to constantly be having food. Wood is used to build buildings. So you'll see here, we have the docks, we have the barracks, we have all these different buildings here that essentially cost wood. So you're gonna be needing wood to build all this good stuff over the course of the game. Uh, also, wood is uh, can be traded, you know, even if you don't need it, you can always trade it at the marketplace as well. But generally it's just for buildings. It's also used for some soldiers. So spearmen, for example, cost a little bit of wood. Bowmen cost a little bit of wood. Typically elite troops like men at arms and cavalry and uh, things like that, like knights, more elite troops, more heavily armored troops cost gold instead of wood, whereas lower tier troops cost wood. Um, so it, it fluctuates. Artillery also costs a lot of wood. So if you have a siege workshop in the later stages of the game, that is going to be costing wood as well. Gold is a resource you need to advance through ages to build technologies, which we'll show you as we do progress. And uh, of course, gold can also be a very lucrative resource to trade at your marketplace to buy whatever you need in a pinch. That's a summary of those basic resources in stone is used to build stone walls, stone gates, uh, keep a big defensive building. Also, if you want to expand, you're going to need stone unless you're playing uh, the English, of course, who can expand using a landmark, which is quite neat. So you don't necessarily need the stone for that. And uh, that is pretty much the basics of stone, of course. And you do, of course, need it for the big cathedral and your final landmark at the end. So here's the idle tab right here. You can see there are six Z's, which means that the workers are not doing anything. So over the course of the game, you want to be checking this to, you know, every 15, 30 seconds, take a look and see if you have any idle workers so you can reroute them and give them some basic things to do. Here we do have our scout. The scout is a unit you start with. And what you want to do with the scout right as the game starts is actually ride around and look for sheep. And now we'll jump into a more basic kind of a gameplay demonstration. So I'm going to play like the first 15 minutes of the game and I'll explain what I'm doing while I do it. So first things first, you start with the sheep near your base. The most efficient thing in my experience is just to go after that first sheep. And what you do is you start going with your worker. What I like to do is also click on my town center, hit control four to put it in a hot group. So now every time I hit the button four on my keyboard, I can go here and then hit the hot key for my villager, which is Q. That's a good way to constantly produce villagers. And when you are in this game, you want to be producing villagers nonstop. So we got the sheep, right? We rode with our scouts to go grab those bad boys. Now what you do is you hit Q, which is the herd button, you click on the town hall and homeboy is gonna run those sheep to your town hall. So you just kind of are playing a little bit of a sheep simulator here where you go around the map with your scout and look and do your thing. So we'll find more sheep, we'll bring them back. You can see there's another sheep here. You wanna be kind of on top of that. Now you'll notice here it says eight of 10, that is your supply. So if you reach your supply cap, you're not gonna be able to produce more stuff. So in order to remedy that, you build a house and then we can just pull him back to his business. In the meantime, we're just gonna kind of keep looking for sheep here. Now also note in this video, we're not playing in the most efficient way in expedited competitive builds. It's more designed just to show you guys the basic mechanics of the game. And again, we will be getting into the more advanced mechanics as we do progress. So now we have our first house, our supply is up to 20, which is going to allow us to continue to produce workers by using the hotkey system. So my scout is control grouped in control one. So if I double tap one, it goes to him. If I double tap four, it takes me to my town hall. It's a really effective way to jump around the map. So now we have some more sheep, so we're gonna bring them back to our town hall. Now the sheep will run out eventually, and when they do, you're gonna to wanna to look for alternate food sources here, like these berry bushes, or there are hunting camps around the map, which we'll show you. But now to advance to the next age, we're gonna need gold, because if we just sit here all day just farming sheep, we're not really gonna go anywhere, so often you wanna drop off the resources before you go do something else. Now we're gonna set up a mining camp. And the mining camp, we're gonna set up as close as possible to the gold node. And now we can send workers. We can hotkey them by right-clicking here on the gold node to set the rally point. And we're gonna set workers here and also pull you to get down here. So the scout has herded the sheep. Something else you can do with the sheep, if they're not in the best position, you can move them as close as possible to the town hall to reduce the distance that the workers need to go to basically drop off the resources. And now we're gonna continue scouting the map with our scout, basically just looking for other, you know, resource nodes and hunting camps and things that we really want to be, uh, you know, getting going. So we're looking around the top here. Down on the bottom here, you can see that our workers have begun working on the gold vein, which is going to show here with our gold income, currently 258 food per minute. Our gold hasn't really been updated yet because they just started. 
And now we found a deer camp. So deer camps are a great source of food, definitely give you more than berry bushes and uh, sheep in the beginning, but they are exposed and away from your base. So you gotta be careful with these. If your opponent's putting early pressure on you and you have the military disadvantage and you can't protect this, you can have problems with that. But I'll go ahead and give you guys a little bit of a remedy for that in a minute. So now we're gonna get our lumber economy started. Drop off the food that he had with him just to make sure we don't lose it. And now we're gonna start getting some workers on wood. Now to advance to tier two, you just need golden food. You can go with a lot of wood at tier one. On island maps, you typically wanna go massive amounts of wood at tier one or age one before you advance. But on this map, again, for the sake of this tutorial, it's not necessarily as important. If you wanna see more optimized builds based on maps, I would recommend checking out the battles I will have on the channel because those are gonna be using more kind of flushed out builds. Today is just showing you the basics. So we're looking around here. We now have a wood economy going. We have our gold going. And now we have enough to advance. You can see we have 500 and 200. We could have actually done it a little bit sooner. And you'll see here, advance to the feudal age. Now, when you advance in Age of Empires, it gives you an option of two landmarks. Usually one is military focused and one is economic or more kind of macro focused. In this case, we're gonna choose to build the council hall, which produces our unique longbowman unit at 100% speed, which is very cool. So typically I would recommend getting like three to four workers. You can power build, so you can grab multiple workers and get them on this landmark, which is gonna build it essentially you know, four times as fast. So they're gonna get there, they're gonna get working on that. And now when the landmark finishes, we will go to the next age. So we're still looking around if this were a normal game. I would of course be scouting my opponent's base and looking to see if they're trying to rush me, if there's any shenanigans going on, et cetera, et cetera. If you look here on the bottom, you can see we have the first, second, third, and fourth age. So these are all the buildings you can build in the first age, which we're in right now. You can see the buildings for the second age and so forth. So we'll keep scouting around, keep looking and uh, seeing if there's opportunities for expansions. The gold business is going well here. So you can see they're still just kind of getting ham. And our food economy is okay. It's at 2.30, but at this point, you might want to start thinking about maybe expanding outward. We're about to run out of sheep, right? So you need to plan ahead for this. So build a mill next to some berry bushes here, and then you can start rallying some workers over there. And when they finish with the sheep here, they can then go on over to the berry bushes and start getting you food in that way. But we are finding more sheep on the map. We'll bring them back. But you know, sometimes if this were a normal one-on-one -on -one game, uh, your opponent would have gotten these sheep and you wouldn't have. So you need to kind of prepare for that transition. You also notice we're getting a little bit close to being supply blocked here. So we're gonna come down build another house. And something I recommend is always leave room around your town hall. You don't want to build right up against it. And we'll show you why in a little bit, because typically your first batch of farms is built very safely around your town hall. However, the English as a faction have the mill influence. So if farms are built around a mill, they're more, they're more efficient. They farm faster basically. But with most factions, you want to build your first farms around your town hall. So I would recommend leaving space there. So we are about to finish the big council hall here, which is our English landmark. And now we are in a new age. So the council hall, it is a unique building which lets us essentially build our long women. So it serves as an archery range which can just build long women, which is pretty cool. So we'll keep the worker production going. You guys have probably noticed we've been doing that the entire game. And uh, we need a lot of lumber now because we're a little bit behind on lumber. So let's go ahead and get some of that so we can, uh, you know, start building some infrastructure and showing you guys the different buildings. So we're gonna keep scouting. We're gonna drop off the sheep here. So when they finish with the berry bushes, the sheep will be there waiting. And you can see Bo Peep and the uh, goon squad there has come in to start harvesting the sheep. At all of your different production buildings, so a lumber camp, you have upgrades to more efficiently harvest. So you can double the rate at which they chop trees, which we'll get. And you can also double broad ax to increase their gather rate by 15%. Over here, we have the wheelbarrow, which increases carry capacity, which is a very good upgrade. We have horticulture, which you don't want to get until later because this one basically increases your farm harvesting rate. Although it does affect the berry bushes, but typically I save that for later. For now, we'll go ahead and get the wheelbarrow, which will increase their capacity that they can carry by five and also their movement speed by 15%. So quite nice for sure. We're gonna keep producing workers. We're getting a little bit of lumber now. So what we would do here is probably start producing some longbowmen if we were in a normal game. So we'll produce some of those guys to defend our lands and make sure that England is kept safe for England, James. And of course we wanna build some houses here. So we're gonna come down and you can build one house here. And if you hold down shift and click, it'll queue up a second house. Now, typically I wouldn't recommend doing this per se, but I'm just kind of illustrating how you can shift click and do buildings. Now our longbowmen are here. They can kind of just patrol the lands and keep your base safe. And in terms of other infrastructure, our scout is looking around and uh, looking for trading posts. So once we find some trading posts, I'll show you guys how those work. So we almost have enough for a marketplace. 
This is a market. So a market is a place where you can essentially trade resources for any other resource. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but we'll explain it once it finishes. We're gonna keep looking for trading posts here and see if there are any on this map. Hopefully there are. I, I was pretty sure there are some on Dry Arabia, so we'll see what we can do. Here you can also see there's an upgrade for specialized picks. So if you wanna upgrade that, you can. If you're looking to prioritize gold and go for a more economic style of development, certainly not a bad idea by any stretch of the imagination. So now you'll notice that we don't really have any stone, right? And like, it's generally a pretty good idea to expand. Now with most expand, most factions, I would do this, right? I would grab some stone here, but with England, their next landmark, of course, is actually a, a town center. So you get to basically do that using food and gold with England, which is pretty cool. But we're gonna kind of pretend like we're playing a generalist faction that doesn't have access to that really, really cool perk. So our upgrades are finishing and things are looking good. And considering we're playing England, we can grab a couple farms here. So a really cool tip about farms is you can actually get either a mill or a town hall and click on it and hold down shift. So one, two, I just click twice and that automatically builds two farms. They're going to build those farms and then they'll start working them. Now if we have our market. I recommend hotkeying this with a hotkey of your choosing, but here I recommend using control six and you can build traders. So we're gonna build a couple of traders. Here's a marketplace up top. You right click on that and then the traders will go there. They'll gather gold and then they bring gold back. The longer the trade route is, the more gold you get. On top of that, you'll notice here, we have the option to spend 130 gold to get 100 food and basically spend gold to buy any resource. You can also sell said resources for a little bit less gold. So this is really useful if you're in a bit of a panic, you need to, let's say, uh, respond to an immediate threat. You're like, oh God, I need a bunch of wood or I need a bunch of stone to build walls quickly and keep my opponents out of my base. That is what you want this market for. So we'll get a couple trades going and uh, you guys can see how they work. Another building here is a blacksmith. The blacksmith is where you get your military upgrades. So we'll make sure to show you that. So we got some more sheep. Let's go ahead and bring them back. We're gonna herd them to the mill. The English farm economy is going. And now we probably need to focus a little bit on gold. So we're gonna pull some lumber workers because we're doing okay on lumber, switch them to gold. And that's a good thing to do. You know, readjusting your workers as you notice. And also you'll see how my lumber guys are having to go a little bit too far to drop that off. So what you can do is build a second one, get them on the trees, and then basically just delete this old one to create space for farms and different infrastructure. And now they're gonna have a little bit less distance to go to drop that off. So we're running around the map. We have old Bo Peep coming in here to drop off the sheep and we will do that at the mill. So you just get right on top of the mill and hit the Q button like we talked about earlier. The long women are here. And if you were being threatened by your opponent, you would probably build more. You could also do this. So oftentimes near valuable resource nodes, you wanna build something called an outpost. So outposts are towers. And what they do is they don't shoot on their own. But if you garrison workers or military units inside of them, they are going to basically uh, start shooting arrows out of it. So you can also garrison your longbowmen, you can put spearmen in there. And it's a good situation because if your opponent comes by to raid you, you can garrison the workers, which we'll show you in just a minute. So we're continuing to produce here. Our gold is coming up. You'll see we have 1200 food and 380 gold. We need 1200 and 600 to get to the next age. And now that we have enough stone, we have 300 stone, that's what you need to expand. We can actually pull them off and just put them back on lumber because with stone, like oftentimes you mine it till you need it and then you switch, but really it depends on your strategy and you can kind of, you know, just adjust to what you want to do. So the traders are on their way. You'll notice they're coming back. Uh, be careful and make sure you can protect them if they are, you know, on a route like this, right? You're going to want to have some cavalry or have some vision and see what your opponent's doing. Or if you're able to pin your opponent in their base with early pressure, you can then develop trade routes and really, really benefit from that. So the outpost is here. You can hit garrison by hitting the F button and then clicking here and homeboy is going to run in there. You can then uh, add some, you can reinforce it with stone to make it stronger. You can build cannons on top of it later on if you want to, but then you click on the worker like so, and then right click out and he'll jump out. Something else you can do in a panic, select your workers, hit the G button called seek shelter. And what that does is the workers basically just go for the nearest, most garrisoned building. So let's say that an enemy's running by here, right? So you're here, they got some long women coming to attack you. You grab them, you hit G, boom, just like that. And suddenly they're gonna defend themselves and you can ungarrison all units by hitting F as well. And then they're just gonna jump back out, grab them, put them back to what they're doing, live long and prosper. So now we have enough to go to the next age. You probably heard that sound effect while I was explaining. And what we're gonna do is build the King's Palace. So we're gonna build the King's Palace up here. This is an expansion and it is our landmark. So we're gonna grab four workers to get on it. They're gonna build it, continue producing workers here. And now, you know, we can start switching to a farm economy since we're playing England. So we'll go ahead and shift click here around the town hall. The workers will go do that and we'll grab a couple of you guys and build farms around the mill because England wants to do that. So now the farms are gonna come in pretty strong. We'll get the horticulture upgrade to make sure that they farm a little bit better. The town, King's Palace is on its way 
And uh, we can also get really, really greedy on the food department since we're just doing a tutorial. We'll build a mill out here and start a deer hunting camp. So we could have built other military infrastructure. We're going to go ahead and build a blacksmith here. We're going to use the marketplace to actually buy some wood real quick. So we just bought some wood and that should be able to help us uh, do some fun stuff. So we're going to build the barracks here. These guys are finishing this building. The trade route's coming back. So when it does come back, I'll make sure to kind of show you the uh, drop off it gets. And now these guys are going to start hunting deer here, which gives you some pretty darn good food. Now, there is one more source of food I haven't shown you, which is the boar, the wild boar. Now, they're very strong. Usually you want to use military units to kill them, and then you can go ahead and, uh, you know, basically uh, set up a mill next to it and start farming. It is 2,000 food, which is a lot. So they're kind of high risk, high reward. Here you can see we didn't quite finish these, so we'll make sure to uh, get you on this, you on this, and you on this. So now we got the farms going. You can see it's pretty consistent food. Our farm economy will increase pretty massively here in a second. And the English people will eat well. So a couple other upgrades. We have survival techniques. I don't really recommend this one. It basically just helps them carry meat when they're hunting. In my experience, it's not really worth it. And we do have professional scouts. This one allows your scouts, which are your mounted scouts, to actually grab the carcasses of animals from across the map and bring them back. There's some pretty advanced tactics with this. You can basically kill the enemy deer camp and then jack their deer from them and bring them back to your base, which is really hilarious. So the King's Palace is finished. We are going to build our last kind of tier two military building. We'll go ahead and get a stables and uh, our lumber is kind of lacking a little bit. So now these guys will go. We have a second town hall. So we'll start macroing out workers from this and from this. So we're just going to be getting a massive economic boon here. We have a trader coming back. So let's keep tabs on this. And here's the blacksmith. So at the blacksmith, you have all these different upgrades. You have, uh, and it's a little bit different than you would expect. You think like, oh, these are ranged upgrades for like my range units and these are for melee units. That's not quite how it works. So this one increases the damage of melee, non-siege melee units by one, and this increases the melee armor of all non-siege units. So even your archers will get the fitted leather work. And these are, this is armor here, the undermesh against ranged attacks, and this is basically buffing your archers and their, their combat capacity. This is siege engineering. This is a very neat upgrade, so we'll get this so we can show you. So if you're doing like an early rush with siege engineering, we can start building some troops now just to show you how that works. We're gonna research it. Siege engineering a lot makes it so your military troops, your infantry can actually build siege equipment like battering rams. And rally here makes it so you just produce infantry and troops faster. It's it's pretty neat. So that's like a good late game one that you typically want to get. So our farm economy is doing pretty good. We're up to a thousand food. We got our wood back on track and we are also going to be building stables here so we can show you. Now you'll notice when we advance to the next age, there's upgrades available. So when you get spearmen at the first age, they're just basic spearmen, right? But if you click on veteran, this upgrades them to the next tier. So each age you come with gives you another, you know, troop type or another tier type. We're going to upgrade our longbowmen to veteran. You can see unique upgrades for the longbowmen here, allow them to set up camps and arrow volleys basically increases their attack speed by 70% for a short period of time. A lot of neat stuff. But again, that's the faction unique stuff. It's, it's going to, it would take a long time to go over this. I'm not doing a guide on the English today. So we're just going to kind of show you the basics. So you can see we have access to men at arms now. We're going to want to upgrade those to get a little bit of troop quality here. We'll keep producing workers here, keep producing workers here, and we don't want to be supply blocks. So we're going to come over here and start building some houses using the shift key to just kind of click. That worker will build all of those houses and we'll enjoy our best life. So siege engineering has finished. Now you'll see that we do have the uh, ability to build battering ram equipment as soon as the house does finish. We should be able to do that. So we'll go over here and have this character help build those. So the dreaded supply block. Also, you'll notice if I just have this worker stand, you can see that we do have the population uh, showing that we have the idle worker, another thing to look out for. So now it's tier two, or tier three, excuse me. We get access to a couple new things. We get the monastery, which is our religious building, and we also get the siege workshop. So we'll build both of those real quick. We'll grab a couple workers to help with that. So they're gonna go build that. And we are now getting pretty good lumber economy. The siege engineering upgrade is here. So if you're doing an early rush on your opponent and they're like turtling up, you can get siege engineering at tier two and build battering rams. So you can see here, these guys can all help. So all of them are gonna jump in and help build that battering ram at a fast pace. And we could be attacking the enemy base, which is pretty cool. Outposts here, we can add emplacements. If you're expecting a lot of harass, you can build these spring alled emplacements, which are like defensive ballistas. Lots of neat stuff you can do with that. And at each age, you can get like more advanced upgrades for like farming. You'll notice here, we have a new lumber upgrade. We just don't have the gold for it at the moment because we don't have too many on gold. So since we're lacking on gold, we'll grab both town halls, right click on that gold node and make sure to send them over there. We've got six idle workers as well. So let's put them to work here on ye old gold mine. We have more idle workers here. Let's pull them back on gold and just kind of keep looking around for idle workers to make sure we are covered. So we have the siege workshop. 
we have access to the Springald. Now, this these are basically universal artillery pieces, except the Ribald here at the very end. The Springald is a ballista, which essentially is designed to snipe enemy artillery pieces. So you want to use this. It's okay against cavalry, pretty terrible against buildings. What it's really good against is if your opponent's getting mangonels or other artillery pieces, you want to get that bad boy. The mangonel is the next artillery piece, which you can get, which is an anti-infantry piece. It's pretty good against cavalry too, but basically when they have blobbed up armies, this thing does AOE damage. Next, you have the counterweight trebuchet. Counterweight trebuchet, of course, is an anti-building piece. So it's for siege and keeps, different things like this. And the Bombard is gotten at the Imperial Age. And this thing is just like, this is the one who knocks. This is the Walter White. This guy is just going to be bombing from deep and really, really doing a ton of damage against buildings, cavalry. It's just a monster. And this is a unique artillery piece. Most factions have their own like late game artillery. Here you can see his little ballista. It takes time to set up and shoot. And here's all the respective upgrades, which we won't go over today, but they increase speed, attack rate. You guys get the picture. So we're progressing pretty well. Our gold is pretty bad. You'll notice we have a ton of food. So if we were in this situation, we could hit the Z button to sell food for gold. And look at that. Just like suddenly, because we, we made a mistake, now we can, you know, more or less tech right away because we sold all that. And we can go to the final stage. We're going to build our last landmark, which is the Wingard Palace. Uh, you have a couple options there, of course. We could build the Berkshire Palace, which is like a really sauced up keep. Oh no, our traders are being attacked by wolves. So let's go ahead and grab our longbowmen and our troops and go attack the wild wolves. Cursed things. We also want to build some priests or monks. Each faction has its religious units with its respective upgrades. The Roos, for example, can build these guys mounted, but we're going to build a monk here and I'll show you guys what you should be doing with the monk. So we'll send some villagers to go save that trader who's going to be returning the gold. Our gold per minute is 500 and you can see all this. The one thing we are lacking on a little bit of stone, so we can go ahead and uh, get get busy on the stone again. Actually, we don't need to build that. I was mistaken, so we'll do this. Send you out here like so. We'll start, go ahead and switching to stone so I can show you guys a little something, something that's going to be going on and get you guys out here. Great. So the landmark's finishing. We got our battering ram. Something else, if you guys need to get rid of units, like so you have a max out army, you can also hit the delete button by holding this down. It will destroy the units. We have a bunch of idle workers here in the farms. So what you could do is you could set up another mill and then just get another farming situation set up. So you want to be constantly scaling your economy to the later stages of the game. The monk should be out in a second. So here he is in all of his glory. He's just going to be cruising in like an absolute pimp. So what you can do with monks, you can have them support your troops in combat with healing, which isn't bad at all. But the first thing you want to do typically is look around the map for these little golden nodes. So you're going to be seeing here we have a relics. So we're going to go grab the relic and then we bring the relic back to the church and we'll show you what happens when that uh, becomes the case. So we finish this building, which can actually build its own army, which is very, very neat. Also, as you advance, you want to upgrade your men at arms to a more advanced stage. Uh, we want to upgrade our longbowmen to elite longbowmen, so we'll go ahead and sell a little bit there, and our longbowmen will be elite. As you do advance these units, they actually change in appearance. They uh, they get like additional armor and like kind of more cool bells and whistles. We'd also probably want to be building more traders if you were in a, a very comfortable position like this. We'll get you guys on stone, and we could use the stone to expand again. So if you're really, really looking to macro heavy and take map control, you could like move up here, get another expansion here, like so, next to that gold node, because gold does become something that you fight over pretty quickly. So look at that. Right, as we do that, we'll have all those workers run down, power build that building, get us additional gold. And of course, uh, we can start producing some troops. We can produce some guns here. We can start producing some basic horsemen and some longbowmen as well, just to kind of get a bit of a standing army. Build some more houses since we're supply blocks, like so. And then bring them back. We're not supply blocked yet, but we're getting there. So gold is a little bit tight for us. Obviously, we just finished off our gold. Our trade uh, folks are going to be bringing gold, but we're going to be jumping over here to build this town center and making sure to kind of do that. So now that the priest is coming back, you can do two things with the relic. You can use it to actually mass convert by hitting the T button. So he's going to chant. Check this out. And if anybody stays in this aura for the full duration, uh, they actually become your soldiers at the end of it, which is incredibly cool. So you can do that in battle. Uh, but what you do is you go back to your religious building, you drop it off and watch this. So... Now we're getting 100 gold a minute for free. So what you would want to do is continue hunting for these relics. So we'll get you going down here. We have another priest here. So we want to go relic hunting. This is really important because getting 300 gold a minute for free when gold starts to become scarce on the map is so nice. And now you can see these guys are doing this. We have another expansion. So we'll keep producing workers here. We'll keep producing workers here to minimize the distance they're traveling. We're going to go ahead and build a lumber mill here. And now we're at tier four. So you've seen most of the buildings. This is a university. This is like the late game research building. It gives you like kind of really, really powerful tools. Our priest is being hunted down, so we're gonna go ahead and save him if we can. Now you can see a little bit of an army farming. We got some men at arms, which are troops, and we're going to go ahead and explain the rock, paper, scissors of this game as it pertains to troops now that we've gotten a little bit later on. So uh, let's go ahead and produce, produce some troops. We'll kind of explain everything too. So we'll get a mangonel. 
We'll come over there. Let's go ahead and trade some of this. Get a counterweight treb. And yeah, all right. So the monk's going to continue relic hunting. We'll send him down here to grab the goods and pull it back. Also, you want to make sure to be kind of getting upgrades. So we'll just kind of get the basic upgrades. The upgrades are catered to what your opponent's doing. So in this case, I'll get them all just to show you. But you want to cater those to what your opponent is doing. So we are going to muster some forces here. And now that we have enough stone, something you would want to do to defend like a really, really important position like this is build like a big keep here. The keep is a massive protection piece, which is going to give you uh, arrow fire. And England also gets a benefit for keeps as well. Keep building traders. It's constantly kind of remembering to, you know, macro and do all the good stuff. Here you can see these are the late game upgrades and generalist upgrades for infantry, for cavalry, for gunpowder, for health of buildings. You guys get the picture more or less, right? So we got the troops piling out now. So let's see if we can get a knight out here in a second. The knight should be able to uh, illustrate my point. Our scout, you know, obviously you would keep looking around where you can. The keep's about to be finished. We'll show you what we can do with the keep in just a moment. And here we have our units. So spearmen units, what do you do with spearmen? Well, as you would infer, spearmen are basically the answer to cavalry. If you look at them and mouse over their tooltip, they get plus bonus, uh, bonus for his cavalry of 18. But where spearmen are very weak is spearmen die horribly to archers. So if we look at the basic uh, archer unit, or for England, the longbow unit, if we mouse over them, they get the rock, paper, scissors against spearmen. They have a bonus for his light melee infantry, which are spearmen. Now, in order to deal with archers, you have the men-at-arms and cavalry. So men-at-arms don't kill archers, but they're very tanky. Here you can see they don't have a bonus versus anything per se, but they have four armor versus melee and four armor versus ranged. Whereas the spearman, if we look, he's got nothing. So this guy can take a beating from ranged and from melee attacks. Men-at-arms are your classic tanks. Next up, you have the basic horseman. The basic horseman here is uh, has a bonus for his range unit. So these are harass units. You use them not in the front lines, but use them to flank enemy archer positions and to torch enemy artillery because artillery can actually be burned down by infantry and melee units by having them attack. Next, you have the knight. The knight is a, a pretty solid archetype for sure. He doesn't have a bonus for anything, but again, it's armor. It's, it's kind of like the cavalry variant of the men-at-arms. Uh, they make a pretty good front line choice and can certainly do well for you. Now we have a couple of artillery, so we'll attack ground to illustrate their points. If you hit G, you can attack ground, and you'll notice it's like a spray fire shot, right? The counterweight trebuchet has massive range, so we can shoot from like downtown, just from deep. So we're going to give it an attack order like all the way down here. So this thing is used to siege keeps, to, you know, just break up positions, and he's going to be throwing really, really downtown. You can see the range is actually all the way out here. Aside from that, we do have the uh, we have the counterweight trap and we have the little ballista. The ballista, of course, can't attack ground, but you would use this to shoot enemy artillery pieces. So these are like the basic military units that you can get in your armies. Uh, on top of crossbowmen and handgunners, which I do need to show you guys. I think I built some. So hand cannoneers, yes, are the late game units. Uh, these guys are just like the best ranged piece you can get. They hit incredibly hard, very squishy, but they wreck armor, they wreck cavalry, they wreck pretty much everything they shoot. And they actually can do a little bit of damage against buildings as well. And I believe we made a crossbowman. Let's go ahead and just get one coming out here. Uh, the men at arms are coming, crossbowmen are coming, and perfect. So crossbowmen, let's say you get to tier two. Your opponent is massing heavy cavalry, uh, you know, like knights or lancers or, you know, French royal knights. Well, crossbowmen are your answer. They do plus six against heavy armor. So crossbowmen just destroy men at arms. They destroy heavy cavalry. Uh, obviously in late game, you're going to want hand cannoneers instead. They're just objectively better, but the crossbowman is your early answer against armor. So those are most of the troops here. Obviously we have upgrades to make them go elite. You have armor clad, which makes uh, English men at arms even tankier. A lot of cool stuff for sure. But those are like the basic core units. And here we have another relic. We have another relic. You can drop that off. But, you know, if you have like three relics and, you know, you have an extra one, just like run it with your army and try and convert your opponent's stuff. So um, that is more or less the basics of like that. Now, you'll notice in terms of victory conditions, we have, oh my God, I thought he just like fell over and died or something. We have sacred sites on the map. So you'll see these big rings right here. So there generally are, you know, two to three sacred sites on a map. We're gonna get the cavalry and go look around for the last one, which is probably up there. And we'll move the artillery here as well. So I'll show you a little bit about hawk grouping and all that sort of good stuff here in a minute. So we're sending our priests to go capture the sacred sites. They are gonna go on their, uh, their pilgrimage here. So we'll send one down here. We'll send one of you down here, and the other sacred site hopefully will be discovered soon. We'll actually build another priest to go look for that. So he's going to go kind of work up there. So now let's talk about moving your army. So if you're moving your army, your army is going to be moving at the pace of your artillery. Now this could be problematic if you're trying to respond to a threat. So what I like to do is get my artillery and put them in control group two and have the rest of my army in one. So the army will move at the pace of the slowest unit. So you can have the artillery move, you can reposition, 
And if you want to get even fancier, you can put the cavalry in group three, like so. You can move the army, and then you can like move the artillery independently, move the cavalry independently, but you'll see they start to move at their full speed. So be really ca you know, cautious of grouping everything together because they'll move at the speed of the artillery, which is good if you're moving for like a final battle, but it can also backfire if you're trying to like get to a harass back here and you're like, oh, better get my whole army up there to deal with it. No, you'd want to grab your cavalry, send them ahead by themselves, uh, get the artillery back, and then get the troops and just go like looking, right? Because then they'll move at their maximum speed. Something else, you'll notice how my army is very bunched up. If you are dealing with artillery threats like mangonels, you have formation. So you have the line formation, which puts them in a big wide formation, which you want to use with cavalry to envelop your opponent's army. You have the wedge formation, which I haven't really discovered the use of it too much in this yet, but time will certainly tell, maybe for just driving a wedge, as you the name would infer. The one that you're going to use most is going to be the staggered formation. So if your opponent has mangonels and artillery pieces here, let's go ahead and shoot in. You'll see if we shoot right here. It's not going to be hitting as much. There's no friendly fire in this game, but if I was bunched up, that would basically chunk my entire army. But you want to be in staggered formation if your opponent is using those type of mangonels. So now we're capturing sacred sites. Here you can see we are going to be getting this. We have a lot of idle workers. I've kind of just been ranting here instead of explaining. What you would probably do is just build like a ton of farms here or something, or you would like go build a gold node and like start farming this, and then they could build a keep to defend themselves while they're doing it. That would more or less be your plan. So now we have sacred sites. You can see we have two of the three. We have a priest running up here. He's going to go capture the last sacred site. And then that will set a timer for 10 minutes to win the game, uh, which is pretty cool. You can also see the sacred sites give you 100 gold per minute, which is really, really cool. So even if you're not going for a sacred victory, if you could only capture like one or two of them, like it's still worth it just to get the gold. So again, victory conditions are sacred sites. Destroy your opponent's landmark. So if somebody wanted to defeat me, they would have to kill the town center here. They would have to kill the Council Hall, the Windguard Palace, as well as the King's Palace. You have to kill all their major landmarks, or you just build a wonder. So as far as a wonder goes, we can actually do that by buying a bunch of stone right now. Now, we could just go farm it under the map or something, but for this case, we're just going to buy a ton of stone and just, you know, hope for the best. So, yeah, and we're just basically hitting the hotkeys with our market right now to get that, but we could build the wonder eventually. But for this video, you guys get the picture. So now there's a 10-minute timer. We'd win in 10 minutes. That is the basics. Now... You guys hopefully understand the UI, you know, the supply blocking, like how to work your workers, how to set up your farms around mills and your town halls, trade routes, different infantry types, rock, paper, scissors. It's kind of just a bit of a crash course where I just rant and it explain things. But now if you guys want to see how to efficiently play, uh, I do have other videos coming out. Of course, I have one on like tips to really like maximize your efficiency. I'll have faction specific guides. But more importantly, I would highly recommend watching the battle reports I'll be doing where I'll be casting high level games, including my, my mid level games. But I will also be casting high level games so you guys can see professionals playing and really, really kind of get a grasp on tactics. Because there's so much more to this game than what I just explained. There's timing pushes. There is so many different variants of builds you can do. So many different base layouts. It's a very complex game. So you guys will hopefully be able to kind of get that from uh, some of the other videos I will be putting out. So thanks again. Really appreciate you all. Welcome. And uh, looking forward to hosting some tournaments and seeing you guys on the battlefield. Cheers, my friends.